you heard rumors about some hag up in these mountains called the Iron Witch? You look happy, though. No. We've been but rolling boulders down mountains. You've come across the story of King like John's these. Iron Hammer's treasure? According to my information, that tomb lies buried beneath the ruins of Croc's Hollow. The Norn believe in personal strength, individual victory, and an earthly spirituality that is both primal and complex. They revere the spirits of nature, embodied in animals that are both guardians and the essence of the world. It can be said that there are probably as many spirits of the wild as there are basic types of animals. One spirit of wolf to embody all wolves, one spirit of doliac to teach the lessons of strength and perseverance, and so on. Unlike the human gods, these spirits of the wild do not represent high-minded concepts like war or nature, but instead embody all the complex virtues and vices of the animals they represent. Because of their history, the four most important spirits of the wild to the residents of the Great Lodge of Holbrack are bear, snow leopard, raven, and wolf. These spirits manifested themselves to lead the Norn survivors south after their northern homelands were ravaged by the rise of the elder ice dragon, Jormag. Bear is the most revered of all the spirits, and she is seen as an icon of strength, insight, and wisdom. Snow Leopard is a solitary, stealthy spirit, much like her animal kin, and the Norn respect the secrets she collects. Raven is the cunning trickster, who loves riddles and wordplay, and Wolf is the spirit of teamwork, friendship, and family. Norn choose to follow the path of a certain spirit of the wild because they feel a kinship to the lessons it teaches. It is important to note that simply because the four spirits work together to help the Norn survive Jormag's attacks does not mean that they, or their followers, are always on the best of terms. Followers of Wolf scorn Snow Leopard's stealth as cowardice, and the shamans of Bear have been known to mistrust Raven's adherents, calling their deceptions dishonourable and weak. Tales of epic battles between heroes of each lodge are told at Moots, immortalising in legend both the virtues and vices embodied by their patron spirits. Part 116. I just had a tragic ex cooking experiment in which I <laughs> tried to see what French onion soup and baked beans <laughs> would be like. Uh, it's not very nice. So, uh, I want to come and record now. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm actually recording the same day as last episode, except now it's night. The sun's just gone down. Um, I hope you all had a wonderful day. I certainly did. We've got a cool adventure to head on now as we enter Chapter 2. Uh, with lots of fun things going on. So you notice that our armor has actually changed. We're now in T2 cultural stuff. So no longer the wolfborn. We are in the predatory stuff. Or, yeah, predatory. It's not predators. It's just predatory. Uh, pretty nice. And you'll see it is revealed marvelously, our big bear chest. You know, MMO players are always looking for the skimpiest... Uh, armor they can wear on females. Well, Guild Wars 2's got you covered for the boys. I mean, Jesus, if you like a bit of man chest, this is definitely the set to run with. Um, and yeah, so we're actually starting as well, very close to where the game began, just in that building over there, uh, because I wanted to give you a little glimpse of something I mentioned last episode, but really hadn't spent much time with until now. That is... The body of Isormir. Check it out. So, this is the worm we slay. This is why we are notable. This is why people uh, revere our name. I mean, maybe a little bit more now after having on a, gone on a great adventure with Air and have more legends under our belts. Uh, you know, that's before we even include all the amazing epics we could have gone on out in the open world. But this is where it all really started, and it's very cool that his body stays here. It's got full collision as well. I really love when games have collision on enemy bodies. It feels so much more immersive to me. Guild Wars doesn't get to do it very much because as an MMO it could cause all kinds of problems for players like heeping up NPC bodies in areas that players now can't climb over. Funnily enough there's so much freedom of movement with mounts and gliding and all kinds of beautiful stuff we'll get into with the expansions later with the game. Maybe the arena you know, could get away with it now but at launch especially as the game's been developed it doesn't happen much but here we get it. Uh, there's also the skill challenge. Isormir's corpse has been chewed on by animals and birds. It's been a while since we've been here but it will remain frozen here until the thaw. Its magic lingers as well. Look at that until the thaw. So is that a sense of the seasons here? Uh, we can commune with this place apart and give ourselves another skill point. I still kind of want to show you guys the spirits since 
I mean, I showed you the animations, but we haven't really used them in combat yet. But as for our weapon skills today, we're going to be looking a bit different. I guess these workers want to talk to us. Greetings, Ulfric. That's some beast you killed. But now the problem is, how in the mist do we get rid of the carcass? Why don't you just let it de decompose? I wish I could. It's just too cold up here, so it'd take too long. Plus, the hide's so thick, it keeps out any scavengers who might help us along. And then there's the stench to consider. Well, how about blowing it up? Oh no, we tried that once. Where do you think all the pieces of a sawmill would wind up? Do you want to explain to Newt White Bear why his place got crushed under the huge hunk of an exploded ice worm? <laughs> uh, what about sawing it to pieces? That's a start, but we'd still have to haul it away. Sure, the pieces would be a bit smaller, but we'd be covered in dead worm bile. All that's, and that stuff never washes off. Okay, uh, does this happen after every great hunt? It's not usually this bad, but Newt brought in a real monster this season. Next time, I just say we flush out a rabbit and say it's some kind of death bunny. Much tidier than a sawmill here. You know what's kind of funny? Um, I like, first of all, how this is consistent with what we learned in the tutorial, that it was a special thing, Newt bringing this down, that not all the great hunts were like this. Ours was extra epic, thus making us extra epic. Our face is pretty terrifying with that mask. But here's a funny thing. They talk about a death bunny here. Um, and weirdly enough, when the game was in beta, the devs would cap their beta weekends off with some kind of big special event. The very first beta, I think it was, ended with a special event here on this map where regular enemies became like ultimate champions and zergs with tons and tons of players would uh, beat them up. I guess it was something of a stress test for the devs. And right here, I remember one of my earliest memories of that beta weekend. They spawned a death rabbit, a super dangerous like jack rabbit that no one could really kill. It was slaughtering all of us and we were fighting where once upon a time we actually fought this boss. I wonder if this dialogue is somehow referencing that. There's some other workers here. Hey there, Slayer. How about next time you take out a big creature for the Great Hunt, how about chopping it up into little pieces first? Makes our job a lot easier. And this guy says, hey, it's Ulfric, the Slayer of a Sawmere. Come to check out your handiwork. What are you guys doing up here? We're the official Great Hunt cleanup crew. As soon as our supervisor over there figures out how exactly to clean up a big dead worm, we'll get started. I like the idea of like RPing as these dudes. Uh, better get used to it. I'll be killing many more such beasts before I'm through. Ha, ah, don't let us, let me keep you from that. You kill them, we'll clean them up. So, I mean, our quest ultimately is seeming to be leading to an elder dragon. Will we leave a corpse of this magnitude, but way bigger eventually? I guess, uh, we will see a nice little hint in the dialogue there as well. The ravens kind of beadily eyeing it just to see if they can get it a piece eventually when they can get through the, uh, hide. So there you go, uh, just a nice little thing that I wanted to show off, uh, before we start our adventure today. We're going back to Holbrack to meet with air and I do want to do another little exploration how about this time we check out the hero's compass so I guess this is as good a place to start walking as any. We're back at Snow Leopard Lodge near the, the creepy cave of the Sons of Svanir. A nice glimpse of might and main in the day now. Uh, but yeah, what we could do as we run along here is check out the Asura Gate. Now we already found that grave suggesting that it was where the remains lie of the first Asura to build a gate. But I think if we speak to the gate technician here, they'll have something a little bit even more interesting and maybe relate to that. There's also a really fascinating NPC here I desperately want to show you guys also. So check it out. Here we go. Peter's Waypoints. And you'll, you'll see that Peter is who the, the Waypoint's named after, but the Asura Technician we have is Graf. A very fun thing here too, by the way. If you hang out here long enough, sometimes Hylic will come through the gate and they'll say, Oh, let, maybe this will be a good spawning ground. And then they realize it's too cold and they say, No, 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 this is a terrible idea. And they leave again. Uh, but hey, Graf. Always be loyal to your crew. C -c cold! The, the wind spirals around this bowl of a courtyard and I stand here all day. It's like being stuck in a Freezertron or a Nice Blast. I need more fur. And we say, Well, we wear furs to honor the spirits, not to keep warm. Yes, I've seen what passes for clothing around here. <laughs> the spirits do not require modesty or hygiene or manners. No offense. Ha! You are the smallest comedian here, we say. I'm actually considered quite tall among my people. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Okay, his dialogue is not what I was remembering it being, actually. Maybe it's someone else that talks about Peter. Right, so we get the Asura guy here, but also near... Here he is, Lars Orjan. This is another dude I really want to speak to. Now, in the last episode, we were talking a bit about um, Honor of the Waves and the Coden and the Sanctuaries, right? Once you get to the end of the game, obviously, you're very familiar with that. But for, as far as we are as new players, who knows what exciting, crazy 
locales and people there are out there in the world. Well, the Coden are actually going to become quite a reasonable part of our story right here, right now, um, to do with the Lost Horn of Romke, which is the next chapter. Very exciting. And Lars has got a really cool bit of dialogue about the Coden before we've even met any. So here's what he says. This is my first visit to Holbrack. I have to admit that it takes my breath away. Only one other time have I ever seen anything so magnificent. Now, this is a huge city, so what is it he could be comparing to Holbrack? This place is enormous. What other time? What was it the other time? It was far in the north. I stood at the edge of a vast body of frozen water, and there, before me, was a floating ice ship. It was a Coden city. My mouth fell open in awe. How big was the floating city, we ask? He says, I've never seen anything like it. It towered over me, easily as large as Holbrack, and yet it floated in the water like a glacier. So, I mean, this is mind-blowing. Now, obviously in-game, unfortunately, none of the sanctuaries we visit really are as big as Holbrek. But I love that sense that in lore, these things are actually comparable. Maybe the dungeon that we will eventually go to is actually, you know, Holbrek size with all things accounted for. Or maybe even in-engine, one day, we will find a city size. I sp and the idea that these things move as well. Imagine if Holbrack moved around. Oh, it's so fantastic. Uh, and we can ask actually about the Coden themselves. They were incredible. They stayed in their bare form, armored and armed as if it were their natural form. I could hear them calling to one another across the ice scape and their voices echoed. Now remember, this guy's amazing in so many ways. He's a Norm that doesn't live in Holbrack. That's already a funny thing. But here we get his Norm perspective on the Coden. And he believes that that's just one of their forms, right? That maybe the Coden could transform into other things. They've just forgotten how. Such as how the no we have forgotten how to remain as bears. Uh, we could say, did you approach them? He says, no. They didn't look hostile. But such a vast ship could house thousands of them. I wanted to consult with the elders before greeting them. A wise decision, goodbye. And so he comes here to Holbrek to learn about the Coden. That's how new they are as refugees from Jormag from the far north. These, these races really aren't interacting with one another much right here at the start of the timeline. It can be easy to forget that as you play the game and you start seeing more and more Coden, but they're very, very new to the stage. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I love that guy. Uh, and then the other thing I kind of want to show is the Hero's Compass. So let's have a quick run on over. Hero's Compass kind of is another one of those places that I used to imagine maybe we'd speak to loads of other real world players and hang out a lot. Uh, but you don't get to go there much. It overlooks a big, beautiful lake with an activity in it. Now, I'll get into the details of the activity a bit later. But this is actually, of all the cities, the Black Citadel never had one because the Bane was never properly Im implemented. Polymok was never properly implemented at Ratasum. Who knows what the Grave was going to have. The archery shootout was never properly implemented in Divinity's Reach, but the Norn at Holbrack did at least get Keg Brawl. And that's what you can see looking out on the icy lake here from the Hero's Compass. So Hero's Compass itself, someone should give us a description of it. I can't see anyone to speak. Here we go. We've got this guy, Otter, and you'll see we're actually around it. You get these beautiful sound effects of cracking ice here. Up for a he says, you there, do you know the legend of Lake Morn? And we say, well, tell me about it. He says, ah, Lake Morn, one of the best places in all of Tyria. It was a glacier until Hrothbear came. Hrothbear? When our ancestors first settled here, a glacial shelf loomed over the settlement. Askir told his friend Hrothbear to smash it before it crashed down on them. Taking on a glacier, that must have been a sight. Legend goes, Hrothbear smashed at the glacier for days on end without rest. Finally, the shell fell away from the settlement. There, Hrothbear stood, raising his hammer in triumph. A great legend, we say. That it is. Askir named the newly created island Hrothbear's Rest, for that is where Hrothbear sat exhausted after his victory. And what about that brewery on the hill, we say? He says, Courage Brewery, with the best ale this side of the Shiver Peaks. Head on over to Bear Garden if you're thirsty. So there's a little, like, uh, place you can get a drink or two. But it's a cool story here about this place. There is an NPC somewhere in Holbrack as well that talks about there being caves beneath the city that I've always really loved. But in my running through and trying to find uh, these NPCs and things to say for these videos, I honestly can't find them at the moment. Uh, maybe we'll get to that a bit later, I guess. But I wouldn't even know where to start. But it's a really cool place. Look at the effect of the ice here. It reminds me a bit of the original game seeing the Jade Sea. It's just rendered so beautifully. And you'll notice that there seems to be some kind of a court out there. Well, we can get to that at a bit of a later date. I'll run on up, I suppose, and grab this point of interest. Uh, this is Bear Garden itself. And see if we've got at least one friendly local who might have something to say to us here. 
Looks like we do. This guy here, Vern Two Bear. Good hunting. Ah, oh, I love this place. I come back here every six months or so. In between jaunts into the wild Shiver Peaks. Join me, Ulfric Rumkerson. It's been a while, and I appreciate your company. Uh, still resting on the legend of killing those two bears as a kid, because his name is Two Bear, right? Maybe, but don't worry. Tomorrow, I'm going to do something even more legendary. I've heard the Svanir of a big camp north of Crossroads Haven. And you're going to disrupt them? I'm going to go disrupt the connection between their heads and their shoulders. Uh, puny bodies hiding behind metal men. Haha, <laughs> these guys do not like the Asura, eh? Uh, and I'm taking Gizor here with me, whether he likes it or not. Gizor? He's just never gotten over how Svanir killed his sister. Personally, I figure he just needs to crack some Svanir heads. Then he'll be able to get on with things. All right, cracking Svanir heads it is cathartic, we say. And so, yeah, you got these cool little guys. A nice little bit more of our whole rack tour. I think we've done pretty well with the city, honestly. You guys have seen most of the main areas now. Uh, right, okay, let's go find Air. I think that's enough of that. And see what she's got to say to us about, remember, our second biography decision for this chapter now. Which was that when we were younger, we were given a horn. But just before the game began and the great hunt and so on, we lost it. Oh dear. Well, that's a bit of a regret, right? Maybe we can uh, do something about that. Uh, I love this. This reminds me so much of other games where you frequently return to places. Sometimes there'll people be discussing sculptures. Sometimes it's very quiet. Sometimes there's different people discussing different things. This time there's Garm playing with a wolf pup. And look, they just ran away. Oh, look at this. Hold on. So this black little pup, is this, is this Garm's pup or is this like another villager's pup? It's crazy to think that Garb might be a parent, right? Oh, man. And we can't communicate with them. Very cute. Mighty heirs to Gogan. Once more, Wolf calls on you to protect his pack. I heed Wolf's call, and I'm glad that I will have company. Ah, oh, there's the Slayer now. Okay, actually, maybe it's Fastulf's pup. So it's Fastulf again. It's great to see him. He appears in so many of these story steps. It's brilliant. Very coherent. Uh, hey, Air, what's going on? I wish you clear... Trouble is brewing. And Fastolf the Wolf Shaman has summoned the two of us to deal with it. Wolf sent me a dark vision. My friend Krennic's homestead was burning and besieged by ice creatures. I saw you there with air, fighting them off. It's a clear sign. Of course I'll help your friend. If the pack needs an alpha, I'm ready. Wolf's vision hints that you two are meant to walk a greater path. I can see that his wisdom and cunning live in both of you. Wolf knows I would never turn my back on a friend like Krennic. I'll meet you at his homestead and we'll deal with any trouble together. Okay, everything seems somewhat unrelated to our horns so far. What do you guys have to say? The journey continues. You have my attention. We have to take Fastoff seriously, Air says. It's good to see you again, by the way. His visions have guided our people through times of trouble before, and he's never been wrong about imminent danger. Fastoff has them often. I thought reliable visions were rare. Most shamans are sensitive to this sort of thing, but Fastolf's a prodigy. We can't afford to ignore this warning. He was very humble about himself before. Don't worry, we'll keep Krennic in his homestead safe. Wasn't the point of Fastolf as well that the prior shaman had an early death? Hmm. Uh, the spirits of the wild. Well so he has some pretty interesting dialogue in the way he talks about the Shiver Peaks. He says, you should hurry, Ulfric. Visions of this sort should not be taken lightly. And we say, well, tell me more about Krennic. Krennic was one of the first to carve out a homestead for himself after we left the Shiver Peaks, he's brave, strong, and proud. And if my vision is correct, he needs help. So you might see this, the way that this is phrased here is incorrect from the writers or whatever. But I, I think it's actually definitely intentional and really fun. The sense being that to the Norn, they're, they're not home, okay? Like, don't get stuck in this trap when you think about the Norn and the way that they're handled in the game. The Norn are not home. They are refugees. Their home is north. And to them, home is the Shiver Peaks. And this is not necessarily, right? You know, going back home is where we saw them in Guild Wars 1. And the Shiver Peaks are what we would call the Far Shiver Peaks. I really like that dialogue there because it kind of shows that separate perspective. And, of course... These are also the Shiver Peaks, and I'm sure the Norn respect that. I like the idea that it's some Norn are just a little bit more unbudging in changing their mindset as to where they are now and get trapped in these old, like, methods of describing places. Uh, I just really enjoy that. All right, I'll see if we can get uh, get that. Wait, what did you actually say about Krennic, though, beyond that? He was the first, one of the first, to carve out a homestead for himself after we left the Shiver Peaks. So he's old. 
or should be very old okay well uh let's see that he gets it and uh his help i mean and we'll be moving off so despite the fact we've been north a few times uh i haven't actually grabbed a waypoint up here yet so i'm gonna skip ahead i'll see you guys in a sec at least past to where we met the Jotun before oh there's a safari here check it out all things have a right her name is nan and she looks very frost appropriate don't you just love the snow there's nothing like this near the pale tree it's wondrous uh what's the pale tree the tree was where i was born the land is warm and green there but this place has its own beauty i love them both oh boy oh man i thought it's kind of cool to see savari yeah i don't know uh all right so i guess i'll cut back in now since the savari distracted me there's gonna be a lot of travel in today's episode an awful lot as we run up this road basically uh we're gonna be moving all the way north of this uh map the wayfarer foothills which actually believe it or not is a very long map compared to a lot of the other uh starter maps in the game a long time ago Way earlier in the series, one of our other characters did actually get a glimpse, a narrow slice of the top of this map. And, well, that will be uh, finally some place that Ulfric gets to uh, by the end of today. In fact, we'll be moving to Snowden as well, which we had short glimpses of before. But it's a bit of a journey to get all the way north. Let's grab this waypoint here, which I probably should have done in the other episodes. Man, sounds good with the Guild Wars 1 music. And see what the scout says about the general area nearby. It's not just the wind and the snow that test you out here. If you're seeking a challenge, take the road north out of the valley. Beware the sons of Svanir. Their dragon cult inhabits the northern area like a dark, violent shadow. So an absolute ton of hearts in this area, but mostly we're going to be dealing with the sons of Svanir. There is a cool side area here. You'll notice that we can actually do a dynamic event. There's another player doing it. There's a couple of players here, actually. They look like they've just started the game. This is cool. Uh, these guys are obviously doing this event. Now, this is to do with this little homestead here where you can help children uh, who are playing with snowballs. Uh, sometimes bears will attack and you can kind of defend it from there. I think the most interesting thing dialogue wise though of this place is if we uh, so here you got this heart vendor She says uh, oh, these kids are wearing me out. It's impossible to look after them all. They won't hold still. Will you help me? Uh, I'm sure we can but here. This is what I like most if you speak to these little children Are you new around? Here? They mention Yeti. Hey, do you want to play Yeti hunter with us? Sure. Why not? Great. You're tall, so you'll be the Yeti. We usually play with Bjarni, but he's helping Linnea. Uh, who are they? Bjarni is really nice. He's been a little weird since he got hurt in a battle. He's around Linnea a lot. She's a bunny worshiper who lives up in the hills. So yeah, this is like an area nearby. And we can say, let's play. Oh, whoops, I forgot about getting ready for the bear ritual. Yeah, we're gonna wrestle some bears. That sounds like fun too, let's go do that. So they're gonna go do that uh, dynamic event. But these kids are playing a, 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 a Yeti related game. Here she wants some honey uh, to lure bears. But Yeti is kind of a fun thing because they do exist in the lore, but the only time we've ever seen them in the entire franchise was in Guild Wars 1, many miles south, way beyond the unending ocean, way far away from anything we've seen in Guild Wars 2. They were in the mountains down there. And so the fact that the Norn know a little bit about the Yeti it's kind of amazing to me. Now, there's a small part of my brain that makes me think, okay, maybe the writers wanted to talk about Yeti and then they realized they were in the universe, so they just wrote it in without thinking much. But the idea that the Norn know about Yeti, and especially as a kid, a, a game that kids play, is really fun. It's even more fun that over all these years of Guild Wars 2, Yeti have not been implemented in this game. Uh, and so they're like this mythical, legendary, ooh, when will we ever find them kind of thing. Uh, just just a fun little thing. So up we're here. Uh, up we come now to the ice steps. We can grab the next waypoint. This is our little outpost. It's a bit like Decider Atom or whatever. Uh, and like Claypool, I think yet. it is. For the humans. Every starter map has a kind of a mini home away from home. It's a town uh, that you can do crafting at. And thus obviously access your bank to. They don't tend to have trading posts here. But so yeah, as we were starting the game at this point, We've got a few levels. We've gathered some crafting stuff. Now, maybe we might want to learn a little bit about what it means to be a jeweler, right? And we can actually open up the dueling panel. Or we can learn a little bit about armor smithing and weapon smithing. I really like this in the starter maps. I think they're very cool. And uh, the norm one's no different. I enjoy them all. Unfortunately, there's really not much dialogue. You can explore quite a lot. And there's a weird hidden room. If we come all the way up here... Most players will end up over here because they'll go for that vista during map completion. But very strangely, if you turn around, 
you'll notice that there's these crates. And if you climb on the crates, deliberately here from the devs, it lets you get on the roof. There's no other way onto the roof. And from the roof, there's actually a staircase down into this room behind this door that never opens. But there's no reason to be here, ever. Uh, I guess if you want to play hide and seek for any reason, uh, that's a good place to go. But uh, yeah, of course as well, we're on the Lion's Road, guys. This is where the Lion's Road and the closest haven to Holbrack meets. A very, very, very long road. And it's so cool, right? Because Lion's Arch feels so far away. But we know if we keep walking on this, eventually we will get there. Um, so yes, all right, we got some barricades. There's often a cool event that can take place near here too. I wonder if it's around with a particularly dangerous member of the Sons of Svarnir doing stuff with wolves. I think he's called the Wolf Master, and he's definitely pretty fun, uh, but I don't think he's around. We're also in Range of a Heart now, where we can just take out these dragon banners and barricades that they may have erected all over the place. But uh, our quest is actually to go to that homestead. You can see all the way over there on the horizon. Pretty nice. Okay, so let's look at our skills as we travel as well. You'll notice I, I have a bow again, but I now have short bow, not long bow. That means the skills are very different. So it now shoots much more rapidly in general. So this is the short by auto attack. As a compromise, it's not as long range. But the auto attack, crossfire, this was an elite in the original, by the way, uh, bleeds your opponent. So it applies condition damage. And also, if you shoot the, sh the short bow behind them in the back, and as a mobile weapon, it's easier to do that, you stack more bleeds than if you shoot them in the front the auto, which is kind of nice. The skill 2 is a lot like the axe 2 I showed you last episode. So here's axe 2, split blade, remember that? Well, the skill 2 is poison volley, and it's a spread of arrows. I kind of showed that really terribly there. They're poisonous, and they do extra damage again, if and la the poison lasts longer, again, if you manage to hit someone from behind. So here, we'll do it there, and it spreads like a fan of arrows out. Again, I've not given you a very good camera angle for that just yet. But yeah, so that's the first two skills. The next one's a double skill again. Fire a quick shot in an evasive retreat, and we gain swiftness. It can be used while retreating. Now, okay, so this isn't a double skill. I thought it did something specific for our pet. I guess not. What it means when it says this can be used while retreating is, if I shoot this son of Svanir, and I run away from him, I can press the skill three, my character will automatically turn around, dodge, and then keep going in the same direction. Not all skills are like that. A lot of them will, like, just get cancel cast if you try and use while facing the wrong way, such as what just happened with Poison Volley there. For some reason, though, it's only on Ranger, I think, that they add that clarifying tooltip, this can be used while retreating. A lot of other class skills could probably do with that, to be honest. But so there you go, that's the first three. We'll talk about four and five in a second. I do want to get into the story now, though. Oh, we got a cool needle here, which triggered one of our achievements. Uh, but I do want to talk about one other thing just before we go up to the homestead, and that's this icy lake. Remember last episode, or two episodes ago, when I told you about a mysterious dynamic event with a frozen lake that you can swim in, and then later it becomes ice, and a big boss spawns there and so on that we'd heard about in an interview? Well, this is it. We're at a meta event right now called the Frozen Moor. This is like the Norn equivalent of the Shadow Behemoth from God's Lost Swamp for the humans, which had that big epic boss, right? Uh, unfortunately, though, it seems the devs kind of ran out of time while implementing this one. And the description of what this meta was with the lake of water that then freezes and you can walk on based on other metas doing, that never actually ended up being a thing. And the meta is very different. Really, it's just about a very dangerous uh, son of Svarnir shaman. You've got to take him out as he summons portals and stuff. It's nowhere near the quality of the Shadow Behemoth. And maybe one of those examples of the small places in which Guild Wars 2 never fully realized its original dreams and goals for the starter maps. Hey, maybe one day if they ever look back at these and try and improve the new player experience, this would be something they go for. But yeah, this is the lake, and this is where I tried to get in just 40 minutes. We've been playing Ulfric for how long now? Uh, four hours, 49 minutes, and... Uh, you know, that's with me leveling super fast with tomes and things and getting lots of money early. Uh, to do that on a demo would have been really hard, but this is where it is. All these enemies would have slaughtered me back then. Okay, so uh, here we have the um, place we're going for, K Krennic's Homestead. Krennic is actually someone we can speak to out here in the open world. Uh, there's even a scout next to him. I brought my ale down south because Kevak says he's all stocked up. If he's running low on customers, there must be trouble at the mine. Can you see what's happened to those thirsty miners? 
when you're through there, you'd help me out by drinking up Kevok's overstock to celebrate. So that's all one thing. Uh, you'll remember as well. So here she's saying Kevok, by the way. This guy's actually called Krennic. I don't know why the voice acting is so weird. Uh, you might remember earlier, way earlier, uh, when we first finished the tutorial, someone in one of these towns was saying, oh, we're trying to get beer shipments from up north. Yeah, welcome to up north. Look how far away they were talking about. We're now here, though, and this is where they actually managed to get a lot of it from. So we can speak to him, but because we're not in the story step, he kind of won't to say the stuff we want him to. He says, have a seat by the fire, though. My place may be remote, but it's as comfortable as any Holbrack tavern, and you're safe inside. What made you build your home way out here? We thought this lake would be a great spot for hunting and fishing. I'm still determined to tame it. You have some trouble We're here in the area, do you? We have Grawl raiding us from the east and Ice Brood swarming us from the west. There's nothing we can't handle. Well, I'm not afraid of those beasts or those ice heads. Ha! Well, you'll fit in here. You remind me of my old hunting partner, Air. Oh, don't tell my mate I mentioned her. Look at that. That's pretty interesting. She used to hunt with her. Okay, uh, wait, wait. Did Air actually announce that to us at the cutscene earlier? And I wasn't paying enough attention. Uh, so, yeah, that's the guy. Interesting that that was a ferocity option there. But I didn't realize it was until I clicked it. Kind of strange. I wonder if that only unlocked because I've been playing Ferocious so far. Uh, but yeah, you can see the Grawl hiding under that rock there. That looks really nice. Um, yeah, let's move on in to the Rumors of Trouble. Hello there. There's some adventures around. Is Krennic really in trouble? Krennic the Short's been building this homestead for years. He's brash, but likable enough once you get to know him. Why does everyone else call him Krennic the Short? He's not exactly small. Uh, we've been up there and seen him, obviously. Uh, the joke is he never seems to have the coin to pay for his own drinks. <laughs> but really, his brother Tor is taller than him, so he's been stuck with the Short since they were kids. Oh, man, the, the crimes of being a younger brother. I'd have fought long and hard to stop me pip stop people calling me that literally <laughs> air doesn't even have a response for our ferocious air, ways here the slayers arrived come slayer speak with krennic okay thank you uh lovely adventurer lady i certainly will well here he is waiting for us up on the hill the spirits of it's air stigalkin and the slayer of isomir what brings you out here krennic old friend your lodge is looking magnificent. Tell me, have you seen any trouble lately? Omens of bad fortune to come? Dreads are making noise, but that's nothing serious. There is Varg, though. He was here recently boasting about his strength with the sons of Svanir. He does seem changed. In fact, it looks as if you're just in time for one of his visits, spirits blight him. Leave this to me, friends. I've dealt with Varg before. Oh god, okay, so a bully of a norn, I suppose? I wish you clear skies. What are you doing, Varg? I told you, you aren't welcome on my land. I go where I wish. You think you can banish me, a proud son of Svanir, from your stupid tavern? Jormag's name. You'll die for that arrogance. No, if I can help it. This horn is the roar of the ice dragon. Hear it and cower, for it signals your death. Wait. Those are ice imps. Watch yourself. They spit ice. Men, two arms. Cut them down. Wait, what is this? So he has a horn. I don't know. Ulfric might be thinking something there. I love that air dialogue there, by the way, as well. She says, these are ice imps. Be careful. They spit ice. I know that doesn't sound like much on paper, but I think most well-executed good games have a bit of dialogue like that, descriptive of the mechanics you're about to face. Guild Wars 2 so rarely does it, and I think it's because the devs kind of put the gameplay... Like the leveling and the skill execution and the combat stuff. Actually quite late in terms of orchestrating all of the PvE stuff. And so they don't have a lot of dialogue descriptive of what enemies do. Even what Air said there, they spit ice. Okay, fine. That's more the flavor than anything else. They don't have much of that because they weren't sure what they were going to stick with until really late in the day. Where I think, honestly, the game just ended up releasing before they could implement anything really great for a lot of this stuff. Uh, but yeah, so Air kind of gives us that description of the first time we theoretically see ice elementals. Of course, if we'd done a lot of exploring already, we might have found some. But it's something they can only really do super early game where they're sure that players haven't done much in the world yet. You never have dialogue like that for an update now because people have had years to find Stay them. together and force them to come to us. All right, so we can take these waves of mobs out as we're spawned here by that douchebag. And uh, we'll just hopefully survive. It looks like this one spawned an elemental veteran. Let's talk about the uh, skill four and five on the shot by now that you've seen a little bit of how it feels. We've got crippling shot. 
Again, very, very iconic Guild Wars 1 skill. Fire an arrow that cripples your target. If you are flanking or behind, you immobilize them. And with this, our pet inflicts bleeding on the next hit. So I'm going to try and get behind this guy. And you notice all the skills are just better from behind. We can try and immob, right? And then lastly, concussion shot. Oh, it looks like we're done. I'll, I'll still show it off as long as they don't start talking. Uh, daze your foe with an arrow, but stun if you hit from behind. So really good CC, honestly. You can immob, you can stun, daze, uh, cripples on there. It's pretty nice. Uh, and then just reasonable condition damage. For a long time when the game first came out, short bow was way more OP than long bow. But these days it's a bit different. Weirdly, I just got plants there. Whoa! Do you know what? These spirits just got updated, right? As I mentioned on yesterday's episode. You know what this means? That uh, when they die, it's counting as me killing them. And because they are plants, it's given me credit for the plant slayer achievement. <laughs> By using spirits. That's so funny. Wow, that's very weird. Okay. Uh, hey, Krennic. Up for a challenge? Okay, you don't want to say anything. Well, air. I've never seen ice imps this close to Holbrek. Varg's horn must have powerful magic to have summoned them. That's not his horn. It was passed down to me through my family from my ancestor, Romka. His boldness as an explorer is legendary. But why does Varg have your family heirloom? I wagered it at the moot in a dice game with Varg. He cheated, but I didn't catch on until after he'd left. I had no idea that it was a magic horn. According to the family's stories, Romka got it as a gift from a clan of bear people. That must be the Coden. They have an enclave near Hunter's Lake. Meet me there and I'll introduce you. We can find out if they know any more about the horn. So here, we hear that at a moot in a game of dice, we lost it, which lines up with what our biography originally said when we made that decision. Interestingly though, Varg appears at the associated moot along with the Great Hunt, Back in episode one of Ulfric's adventure, you can go back and look at it. I spoke to him. So I wonder whether the devs were playing with the idea that the actual moment that this stuff happened was at the Great Hunt, but later they couldn't find a way to implement it. So then they just suggest there was an earlier moot. I'm almost 100% positive that that's what the devs wanted to go with. And then based on how the other races were being implemented, they realized it kind of broke down and they had to do it all on the character creator screen instead of actually in game. Uh, but it's kind of a funny thing. So that, yeah, uh, we are going to be trying to get our horn back. Rumpk's horn. Rumpk appears right at the end of the personal story is actually relevant here for the Norn characters. How badass is that? Hey, Air, what's up? Did I just hear something about the Coden as well? She says, we can't let the Suns keep that horn. It's too dangerous, and I don't like the great Romk's uh, property being used to serve Jormag, especially when it's your family's own loan. Look at this. Look at how nice she is to us now. Oh, we're such good friends. Look, we may not be as cool as Ritlock and Logan or Kaith, but... Actually, I wonder how much Kate really ever connected with Air, since Kate's a bit of a dark horse in some ways. But still, look, we seem to have a real bond. Neither do I. That's why we're going to be putting a stop to it. Brilliant. Thank you for helping me figure this out, at least, Krennic. Varg has always been a problem, but now he's a serious threat. Can you stop him? My family's legacy is at stake. Only death itself will stop me. So we go on some kind of crazy quest of vengeance here. I'm honestly not that invested in Varg as a villain right now, but I buy the Ulfric is, all right? And that's what really counts. So let's head on out, and yes, we're going to be moving on now to our next location, which is no longer in Wayfarer. That was our last quest here. We're going to be going to Snowdon, the second map. Still a bit of an adventure to get up there, so we'll get moving. Uh, no time like the present. Now, what I can do on short bow, by the way, is I can use free camera, quickly turn my character around, use the skill three, and that dodges me forward and gives me swiftness so I can move quickly. Nice little thing you can do. And many classes have access to something like this. Uh, but so you might see I do that a lot while I'm on this. Obviously, if we were still using Warhorn on our other set, we could just blow in the Warhorn. And we could give ourselves swiftness from that. That Warhorn not being the horn from our story, but just as a ranger skill. Maybe we shouldn't use Warhorn again until we finish this and figure out if we can get our actual stories on. Like, that'd be awesome, right? For today, at least, though, I did want to show you what it means to dual wield axes on a ranger. So, like, Warrior can dual wield axes. We remember what they did. You spin around like crazy. You get lots of really fast attacking meaty hits. Well, Ranger's got similar stuff to how Warrior dual wields axes. Uh, it's the axe offhand, really, we've got to show. First of all, the main hand stuff is throwing axes now, and we 
You've seen what that causes. Oh, there was a scout back here and a waypoint. Hold on, let me grab this. That's Lion Guard. It's our duty to defend the trade roads to and from Lion's Arch. That's made somewhat difficult when one of our fortress havens is under constant attack by the sons of Svanir. We've been so busy going on the offensive against Jormag's worshippers that we barely noticed the Char setting up operations in this territory. So there you go. Even some mentions of the Char here because we're getting close to the Char connecting map. Uh, so yeah, to talk about the uh, Axe stuff, it's similar to how Warrior executes things, but not entirely. So first of all, we've got Throne abilities on the main hand. The uh, offhand starts with Path of Scars. We throw our Axe so that it returns to you. And it strikes foes each way. It's also a pull, right? So this is a boomerang ability, basically, right? I can cast it anywhere I like. It only recently became a ground target with one of the more recent updates. But I can boomerang it behind the Doliac. It hits the Doliac and then pulls the Doliac to me on the way back. That will interrupt whatever the Doliac's trying to do at the time. And you can use it to pull whole chains of stuff together. Like if I boomerang correctly here, I can probably get the ram, the Doliac, and this next ram all together. Ready? Look at that. Oh, this one in the middle never quite landed. But so that's really good because then you can chain it into the skill 5, Whirling Defenses. So this was a stance in Guild Wars 1. In Guild Wars 2, it's a proper activated, special, cool, animated ability. And that was a big thing. Uh, moving into Guild Wars 2, the devs wanted all abilities to have really good animations and be much more visual than they were like passives in the original game. Passives are now like traits, right? Uh, so Whirling Defense is a great example of that. In the original, this just meant you dodged every now and then, and then later you blocked every now and then. But now... It's block projectiles while damaging nearby foes. We basically spin in this big, beautiful animation here, doing enormous damage around us. And anyone shooting at us with their own bows, we reflect back to them. Uh, actually, it says block projectiles. I thought this was a reflect, funny enough. I guess it's just block projectiles. But still, it's really good. It applies retaliation and vulnerability around us. Very, very fun. And it's even a well finisher. So, if I use like a fire trap and then did it in that, we'd be spraying fire all over the place. Brilliant. Cool. So, we come to this road here. Now, we're going to be going left. I do want to point out once again, though, that mysterious Norn village off on the horizon there. Now, we did talk about that way back. And I just want to remind you guys that it exists. This has actually not got anything to do with Norn's story. As you can tell, we're not going to that village. We're moving on to the second map now. That Norn village over there is actually related to story after the main campaign is over. First time I showed you that village, I said, oh, you know, that's ages and ages and ages away. Don't worry about it yet, guys. Well, to tell you the truth, we're getting really close to the end of the game now. And we might be there sooner than you think. So, uh, there is a haven here as well. I guess I'll grab the waypoint just in case we want it later. Uh, the haven, again, this one doesn't have... I guess the havens on this map were a little bit poorly done. There is stuff to talk about, just nothing that was super amazing and fascinating for me. Now, obviously, we've chosen a different biography option. We could have different quests. One of the other quests is actually in that haven, and it's really difficult. Uh, on one of my challenges to beat the game where like you never upgrade your armor or you stay low level and stuff uh, You get attacked by Grawl there and they're some of the most deadly enemies in the game. It's crazy, but uh, for our adventure uh, Old Frick Rumkason does not have to worry about it too much. So coming all the way along here We get this waypoint does this look somewhat familiar to you guys as Terex traveled through here so long ago I guess in terms of the timeline he actually would travel through here a little bit later uh, but instead of going on some massive pilgrimage right now all the way to Lion's Arch, we actually don't have to go so far. We're going to go to a Coden outpost in Snowdon. So Snowdon is actually kind of interesting in how it connects to Frostgorge. We know all about Frostgorge now. And the fact that there's like immense Coden sanctuaries and stuff moving on from the North Seas just here. Well, some of them have actually flitted just a little bit further south. Perhaps refugees of the Honor of the Waves... Well, maybe at this point in the timeline, the Honor of Waves doesn't crash just yet. But, um, you know, there's there's lots of them around, and we will see very soon in exactly how. Uh, so, the uh, story step actually is starting right here. But first, let's head on into this haven, where there's a trading post, pretty nice, and we've got a scout. And this one actually has some very cool dialogue. The road here used to be filled with traffic going to and from Lion's Arch. But now... Even caravans with armed escorts aren't safe. Those sons of Svani youngsters keep acting up and causing trouble. But the creatures corrupted by Jormag's ice are the greater threat. 
If you could help the Lion God secure and protect the area, I'm sure the spirits would smile upon you. So I actually just did something there I quite often try never to do. I actually overlapped uh, very uh, cautiously. We may have heard that a long time ago. Uh, this is not the first time we spoke to this scout, but it's a good to get a quick refresh on what's going on in this area of the world. And look, we got this kid. So this is a Norn kid who actually looks child proportioned now since we are a Norn too. How much longer we gotta wait? Heading out? Tread lightly. And pack your axles with lard. What for? The less noise you make, the less attention you draw. But I'm in business. I want attention. Not this guy. Ooh, seems scary. Talk to my sister if you have any odd jobs you need somebody compact and strong to do for you. Me and her are for hire. Cheap. <laughs> All right, do you want to come in the next story quest with me? Ho, oh, friend, we'll make you a deal. You tell us your legend and we'll tell you about this part of the mountains. Okay, it's a deal. I'm Ulfric Romkerson. She says, what? No, you're the slayer? I imagined you bigger. Your legend is more vast than the Shiver Peaks, almost. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Look at this. Ah, because we are a Norn, we get the respect of the children. Uh, what can I expect if I travel north? Danger, that's what you'll find. You're so hungry? I can eat a whole doya. That's where Jormag, the elder dragon, slept. Trust me, you don't want to go that way. Tell me more. I once saw a Koden come down from the north. He was a walking, talking bear. He told me they have giant ice citadels floating on the water. What can I expect if I travel east? East? I've heard the hunting's good there, but you have to watch out for the sons of Svanir. They're evil. You're like tracking something. Not now. That lion guard said she'd have wilderness. some work for us soon. Got any furs? Not today. Ran into a caravan on the road that bought my entire bundle. Crossroads Haven's out that way, but it's not a very good fort. The sons of Svanir and Icebrood are always attacking it. All right, well, we'll see. What about west? West. Ooh, I wouldn't go that way if I were you. The ice brood is there. Jawman corrupted many Norn and even the land itself in places. It's very dangerous. Well, west is where we'd want to go if we want to get to Lion's Arch. The roads to the west are all messy. Be careful. There are avalanches and all kinds of killing things. The Lion Guard tried to keep the trade routes open, but it's hard. Okay, and finally, south. That's the Sons of Svana territory. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're evil. They follow Dragon, the spirit of the wild that's going to destroy us all if we let it. Which we won't, right? If you stick to the road, you'll come to Snowhawk Landing. The Lion God will watch over it too, like they do all the havens. Snowhawk. Okay, all right, cool. So that's what everyone here has to say. My feet are bigger than that Lion Guard. <laughs> My feet are about bigger than that Lion's Guard. Is that what that kid just said? <laughs> all right, so let's head on in and um, see what we got. Among the Coden. Hey, yeah, how's it going? May the spirits of the wild watch So there's a Coden walking over. This should be interesting. I haven't had extensive dealings with the Coden. No one has. But I know this is as far south as they've come. Why are, that, why are they this far south? Did Jormag drive them down here too? I believe so. The sanctuaries have come under attack lately by Jormag's minions. We have a lot in common with them. Though they don't seem to like us. Wow, if they can help me get back Romke's horn, I don't care if they like me. Wait, 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 you're running past? Okay, so here we get the first Coden of the story. Followed by night. Honored Coden, I come to see if you will hear the plea of a descendant of Romka. Do you know that name? Yes. Romka is well known in our tales as a strange but honorable southerner. If you brought me one of his line, I'll listen. I promise that you want to hear this. My ancestor carried a horn given to him by the Coden. It was passed down to me. It was stolen from me before I knew of its magical power. Now I need to find the horn before there are dire consequences. Your ancestor was wise in many ways and a trusted ally of the Coden. But you? I do not know you yet, other than your tale of loss. So, in Coda's name, prove yourself to me. The dredge to the south ravaged the land. Their mine director calls himself the Overminer. Kill him and bring me proof of his death. In return, I will tell you all I know of the horn resounding. A worthwhile cause. The dredge plague both our races. I'll handle this over, Miner, and we'll talk again. So it's typical that the second we meet the Coden, they're telling us to deal with dredge. 
Ulfric so far hasn't really touched on the dredge. Now, we've had a ton of opportunities to potentially have. There's all kinds of places around the Wayfarer foothills where you can enter caves where there's lots of dredge complexes and stuff. We've heard about them a lot, but we really haven't dealt with them much. It's no surprise that the Coden are having us deal with them. If you remember when we spoke to them in Frost God's Sand, they seemed particularly aggrieved by the dredge because of their strip mining, because of their big machines, similar to how they viewed the char. Air here saying that they don't even like us. I mean, the Coden just seems so sharp elbowed about every one really they come across so we will have to deal with them i want to point out something else as well these guys know romka Time and likes romka like new fallen snow you made a promise norn keep it and then we'll talk there's a very cool thing going on here to most norn the coden and new like air just said right like they're refugees recently but romka was alive ages ago right he was caught up when Zaitan raised from the frickin' uh, belief him while he was sailing following his map, okay? Romka is an ancient hero by Norn status today, and Romka was dealing with the Coden. So, I mean, that's amazing because that's another thing that taps into why he was so legendary. For most of us, this is new and novel, but he knew the Coden and hung out with them and befriended them way before most Norn even knew they existed. All right, that's how cool Romka was as an adventure. That's how far north he must have gone on his adventures. And then before eventually getting on the boat, heading off to Orr. And well, we all saw how sad and tragic that ended, right? I think that stuff's really badass. And you kind of have to think about the separate facts the game, game gives you at very different moments to realize what's so cool about Romka, really. Uh, but okay, so we're going to defeat the Overminer. This is a very simple quest. The dredge use sonic attacks to take down their foes. Alone, they are weak. But in groups, they can be powerful opponents. Fight smart. This Overminer is a strong leader. He will take cunning to defeat. Be on your guard. Obviously, this thing about sonic attacks becomes bigger in the story later, as we've seen. Um, but for our purposes right now, really, we're just going to cleave through them. And uh, we should be okay since we're not reliant on blinds or anything. And these guys are immune to blinds. What I would like to do is show you guys uh, some of our non-racial abilities. So... For other races, you can get quite a lot quite early in the game, you know? Various prayers. You can pray to Dwayna or Cormir or Lissa as a human. As a Norn, if I show you my skills, we don't get a Norn heal. And as far as Norn utilities goes, there's only two. So let's see what they are. First of all, you have Call Worm. So I guess summon and feel the power of uh, the Spirit of the Wild Worm. And we can call to him. And we actually get to summon an, uh, a creature to fight by our side. Kind of nice, I guess, if you're playing like a necromancer or some kind of Zooey character. You want lots of allies. So this is a worm. And as I aggro some dredge near it, you'll see he's mostly stationary. Uh, but he kind of sieges away in the background there. And every now and then, he will go underground, move to a new area, pop up, and do some damage. So necromancers get the flesh worm. But this guy, the Snow Worm, actually moves a little bit more. He's very, very, very weak. You won't find most players ever using this skill for all the reasons I've already explained. The devs never balance racial skills to be that good, right? But then we also get Call Worm and we get Call Owl. So we can Call Owl to attack and bleed our foe. These both feel quite rangery to me. So I like playing a non ranger. So there, you saw very briefly. Look, I'm going to have to edit and slow mo that. When I cast Call Owl, an owl shoots down from the sky, smashes the dredge, and then flies off straight away. It's a bit like when we use Warhorn skill 4 I showed you in the other episodes on the ranger, except only a single bird this time. And really, the damage it does is somewhat close to that. It does three stacks of bleed, which is actually pretty good, and a small packet of damage. Here, I'll show you again. Uh, here we got our dredge Ratnik. Yeah, blink and you'll miss it. It's like just a baseball comes and hits his head, honestly. And there you go. That's the non skills. Only two? Well, why is that? That's because most of them, and they're really cool as a non, actually come at level 30 and they're all elites. You get four separate elite skills just from being a non when you hit level th uh, 31, actually, right? So uh, that's what we'll be talking about in the next episode. Uh, and probably once we're finished with this story, actually, we'll be uh, moving our way on up to that. So, uh, yeah, we, our job right now is actually to search this cave system for the Overminer. There's kind of like a horseshoe, like, you bend you go on as you travel. Oh, well, here he is. You can tell from the combat music. Invaders, kill them, comrades. Okay, kill them, comrades, he says. It looks like you're alone now, though, dude. I've been so exhaustive in taking this cave out. Uh, let's summon the worm, summon the owl, 
Summon some spirits. So yeah, look, our spirits will buff our worm. Oh, guys, the OP synergies. I'm going to try and stand behind him as well. So this is a cool thing with short bow. Because, that, because mobs will nearly always aggro on your pet. You can kind of do what you want and stand behind them. So yeah. A fine battle. You fought with such skill, such precision. The dredge were no match for you. For us, you mean. Two heroes are better than one. Of course. These challenges will prepare you well for taking up the mantle of leadership. Now grab the weapon. Followed by Knight owes us a story. Alright, so we're going to grab the Overminer's Boomstick here and uh, travel on out. You do actually get to use the abilities, and I think uh, the Dredge aren't happy with what we did, and they will attack us on our way out. Yes, they will. Okay, so we're going to come backwards now. You can drop the Boomstick and go back to your regular skills, or you can kind of attack with Sonic Weaponry. I think this is a fun change of pace, so I'll go for it. We can try and rifle butt the guys away if they get too close. And obviously, we still have our utility skills, so that's quite nice. I have to say, that cutscene there is kind of a perfect example of something Guild Wars 2 does all the time in the story that I loathe. That line of dialogue from Air. Oh, you're amazing! Your skill is so incredible! Like, the game is just like a simulator, like, trying to make you feel good. Just throw these ridiculous comments at how great you are that just don't work in a product that has no meaningful combat to any of its story instances. Like, does anyone actually feel good from Air saying that there? <gasps> You're so good at fighting the dredge. Oh, am I? Am I really good at, you know, auto attacking a couple of times because there's just no combat balance whatsoever? It's such a shame. I wish that I had a perspective of the game where that was a really interesting fight we did there and Air's dialogue somehow actually feels rewarding. But it's just so unbelievable and the whole thing just seems to break apart the seams with how the game's implemented at the moment for a lot of these steps. But hey, at least it gets better later. That much is true. So here's your weapon, your boomstick. What can you tell me about my horn? At last, the Overminer will no longer tear out the heart of the land. You have satisfied Koda, and I will aid you. I have sensed a recent disruption in the balance of the land. I imagine it is this son of Svanir you mention, this Varg. When he summons creatures with the horn, only more imbalance results. I have witnessed many active sons of Svanir in Drakentelt. The disruption seems centered there. Drakentelt is a short jaunt south of here. If Varg is there with my horn, it should be simple enough to take it back. I will find you there, and lend you Koda's strength. My people created this horn. We will help you find it. Yes, the Slayer and I started this together, and we'll finish it that way. But we also wish to know more about the Koden people, and we welcome your presence. Okay, cool. So they will come with us. Followed by night, we get the uh, quest completed and a choice of a cool bow. Uh, a Crichton bow, a Shiver Peaks bow, or a Shiver Peaks short bow. Let's go back to the long bow here, I guess. That seems pretty cool. Uh, what do you have to say to us now? I'll meet you at Dragontail, young Norn. Uh, together, we shall see this through. Everyone's calling us young, damn it. I'm curious about the Coden. How come we rarely see you? Our floating sanctuaries provide us with the shelter and solitude we need to hone our spiritual discipline. We seek to preserve the world's balance and attain enlightenment. I understand that, but why have you come so far south? Our sanctuaries have been attacked by the minions of the Ice Dragon. We sailed here for safety, but also to restore a world badly out of balance. We Norn made a similar journey, and we also ran into trouble with the Dredge. Vile, deluded creatures. Dredge bore through the world like worms in an apple, working only for themselves. What's left is of no use to anyone else. Look at, I mean, the, the, you guys might just take this as boring dialogue, right? About the, the dredge as an evil faction. They were so sympathetic in the original game. They were just like these oppressed people that you wanted to see free. And it's so sad to see what has happened to the mountains since then. No argument here. Don't worry, Air and I stopped the Overminer. Air says, you handled that well. Learn to tend that spark of leadership and it will grow into a fire. Do you think there's a leader within our skies? Someone to look up to, a commander perhaps? Feed that fire with wisdom and you will go far. Thanks, Air. That means a whole lot coming from you. I think it would, you know. We're pretty buddy-buddy now. So there you go, guys. Uh, we will leave it here next time. Lots of fun stuff. More fun ranger skills to check out. Also, specializations will be available. Uh, I really want to show you guys marksmanship, which 
supercharges our longbow if we wanted to and bow based stuff. Beast mastery, making our pet the MVP and really ludicrously charging that. There's lots of fun stuff for Ranger Buildcraft. And of course, also that meaty level 30 mark where we get to see the Norn elites. Uh, so yeah, join me for that. We may also even be able to get our horn back there and uh, conclude the chapter. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you have a good evening. See you next time. returned from Divinity's Reach. I met all the challenges of being a Norn author there. I hated that place. A pit of weakness, full of cushy seats and beds with two mattresses. I slept terribly the whole time. 